Okay. So uh, shall we start? Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, so welcome everyone. Good afternoon or good wherever. Morning. <laughs> <laughs> Depends where you're registered from. Uh, uh, welcome our uh, participants from uh, all around the world. Um, so we have actually, uh, you know, our speaker today from, uh, you know, Poly U in Hong Kong, but we also have uh, two industry guests from uh, Thailand and UK. So I will just introduce just a second. Um, um, we will have, uh, today is a webinar for, um, that's uh, the first of the webinar series uh, going along with the fashion tech time lapse that, uh, fashion exposition actually held uh, both online and also on PolyU campus at the ITC store, if you're not familiar with the information of the event yet. Um, so this webinar today, we're talking about the changing technologies in traditional surface design uh, as a representation to kind of dive uh, deeper into uh, the conversation of, um, you know, kind of conventional techniques in surface design. And um, also, I wanted to give a little bit uh, quick intro to the Fashion Tech Time Last event, which is the Fashion Exposition. Um, so it's actually Um, the fashion um, is an exhibition that we're holding. Um, just want to give you guys um, a quick uh, info here. Um, it's a, a group collaborative uh, exposition showcasing three different kinds of both traditional and modern digital technology uh, used in apparel product uh, development. Uh, so if you guys are interested, you can certainly scan any of our background for QR code to access the online information or just do a screenshot right now um, on um, from the slides here. So just uh, to highlight the event basically is the complementary nature between seemingly dichotomous fashion technology, so traditional and modern. So this is... Um, the webinar, first webinar that we have to go along with the, this event. And we hope that you guys will enjoy some more information related to uh, the techniques we're showcasing um, currently at the ITC store on PolyU or Hong Kong PolyU campus. Okay, so I wanna give a little bit brief intro to the our main guest speakers today, which are the featuring, two of the featuring um, design scholars at, from the exhibition. So first, Ms. Jackie Lun, she's our fashion design instructor at the Institute of Textiles and Design, oh, clothing, sorry. <laughs> And then uh, she actually did her, you know, academic training in fashion design um, in uh, some global uh, renowned institution, but also she had some abundant industry experience uh, in uh, functional and decorative textile design areas. Um, so she has came back into academic and to, you know, continue teaching and uh, both educating young talents, but also educating herself, right? Continuing and learning, improving. Um, so she actually is passionate uh, about using both traditional and integrating modern digital tools in uh, the kind of perfecting or enhancing um, current product development processes. And then next we have um, TC Dr. Huan. Uh, she, he is the, our research assistant professor in fashion design as well. So he actually joined us uh, just last year from UK. Uh, he had also, uh, you know, done his academic training overseas. And he's uh, especially research on uh, the relationship between materials and the body. And he's concentrates kind of on the technique of uh, pleating different kinds, whether it's a hands-on or machine-based. Um, so he has been, you know, recognized through uh, global platforms for his work, creative and lecture, uh, those type of, um, you know, media. And 
he actually is quite interested in how we use modern tools and whether it's digital or not, and how we we to really need to critically think about uh, what is uh, really important in our current lifestyle. Um, are all the tools necessary to use in all products, uh, things of this nature? And he can share more as he talk about his presentation today. And I want to quickly introduce our industry guest speakers, uh, but they are actually our panelists today. We will have a panel discussion with um, the five of us um, uh, later on um, in today's webinar. So the first one we have is Man from Mancraft. He's in the area of uh, uh, wearable art using natural dye, locally sourced, locally produced from Thailand. And we'll talk more about him later on. And this is some quick snapshots of his work. And then also semen pleading, uh, we have invited the CEO, Matt Winner, and um, we are having uh, Miss Jo representing semen pleading instead today. Um, we will talk more about uh, their work uh, later on as well. So uh, this is my quick introduction for our participating speakers and panelists today. Um, I will go ahead and turn over to our first speaker. Okay. Um, and please feel free to uh, leave your messages in the um, chat box in a Zoom. And if you don't know um, how to use it, let me know as well. Um, so please feel free and I will try to um, bring in the, the conversation from the chat box uh, into Q&A. Um, and we will actually try to converse, um, answer questions during the panel discussion instead. So we'll go ahead, just have the first speaker and move into the second one and then go into panel discussion, okay? So that's kind of the um, logistics today. All right, so I will go ahead and turn it over to our first speaker. All right. Okay, hello. <laughs> um, I'm Jackie. Uh, as Serena introduced, I'm an instructor of uh, ITC PolyU, and uh, I teach uh, fashion design and other uh, uh, technology related uh, subject uh, and pattern making uh, 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 sewing. So, um, so today I'm going to uh, share uh, my uh, the topic that I love really much, um, which is uh, felting technology. So let me share my, um, right, let me share my desktop. Okay. Yes. Uh, so felting is, Felting technology is um, why I'm going to talk about felting technology because um, first of all, I think this is a very interesting uh, technology which has been um, discovered many, many uh, very long time ago, uh, which is uh, can be considered the most ancient textile fabrication techniques, and this is a traditional handcraft. Um, appear in different cultures. Uh, I, I, uh, we can find felting in different country and uh, all of them with their unique culture. So I think it's worth to talk about it. And also uh, I would like to uh, look into the history of um, felting and the evolution of felting. And then maybe we can find new opportunity for um, preserve this uh, handcraft uh, and also let it um, continue to grow. So what I will talk about is uh, first, maybe we need to know what is felting because some of our students may not be very um, familiar with. So uh, I will briefly talk about what is felting and briefly talk about the history and development of it. And then I will focus on three different uh, felting techniques, uh, talk about um, the process of them, and also showcase some uh, work. Uh, uh, I mean, showing some uh, work from different designers. And then uh, I will look into the um, 
uh, contemporary felting and highlight uh, different uh, kind of uh, how we use uh, modern technology in copperate uh, in 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 copperate with uh, felting. So what is felting? Um, felting, uh, first of all, uh, most of the time we um, talk about felting is uh, wool felting. So uh, wool are from um, sheep and lamb. Uh, there are different kinds of uh, uh, felt, uh, I mean, different kinds of wool fibers. And, uh, but they, most of them, they are very short fiber because they are from the nature. Most of the natural fiber, they are short. Uh, usually, if we want to make fabric uh, for short fiber, we need to um, make it longer, become like a, 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 a yarn, and then we may apply um, weaving or knitting technique to, um, to make a fabric. However, for felting, we don't need to uh, make it longer, but we simply use the wool fiber and we make use of the uh, property of wool fiber uh, and then make the fabric. So if we look into, uh, I mean, we have a closer view on uh, felt, uh, sorry, uh, the wool fiber, you will find the, um, the surface of it is kind of, um, with a lot of texture and uh, it kind of a uh, cream and uh, scaly structure you can find. So this actually allow it to be felt. Uh, usually for our felting process, uh, we will um, add some kind of factors or elements to make it felt. Uh, Sometimes it's kind of um, physical fraction or um, some, uh, chemical reaction, some kind of uh, agent or, or solution, chemical uh, solution. And then with pressure, heat and moisture that can help uh, felting happen. So um, I will talk about this uh, a bit in detail later when I talk about different kinds of felting techniques. But uh, in general speaking, uh, there are two common felting, uh, uh, I mean, felt manufacturing methods, which are the uh, wet felting and uh, needle felting. Uh, in the picture on your left hand side is, uh, is an artwork made by um, uh, needle felting. For needle felting, because you use needle to uh, felt the uh, fiber, so you can control uh, how, uh, the degree of felting uh, easily. So sometimes if you want to make it looser, then you can leave uh, you know, more fiber to be uh, coming out, uh, make it more fluffy uh, in texture. But um, if you want to make it like kind of more rigid, then you can um, maybe punch more, uh, do more needle punching um, action to make it more um, solid. But uh, for uh, wet felting, as I said, you need uh, maybe hot water, uh, some kind of alkalized agent or solution, uh, and then uh, pressing the wool fiber uh, to make it felt. Okay, so this two, uh, I mean, on your right hand side, you can see is an image of, um, I mean, the product of um, uh, made by uh, needle, uh, sorry, wet felting. So wet felting can create something seamless. You can make a boots, you can make uh, even a coat without any seam because uh, it all depends on how you felt the uh, product. Um, it can be without any seam. So for felting, uh, as I said before, with very long history, so I would like to briefly talk about it. Um, just very briefly, because a uh, really long history to, to talk about. Um, the felting technique uh, uh, has been invented much earlier than weaving or knitting technique. Uh, there are many uh, story uh, telling uh, from different uh, culture that about how uh, felt making was developed or discovered. Um, so that was one is about uh, nowhere. Uh, nowhere used a uh, shift wool to line the, the shift, the, the art, the art for, and make it comfortable for the animal. But um, because it was a, a very long journey, so um, the alkalized moisture from the, from the animals uh, actually help uh, 
faulting happen. And also because the animal, they step onto the wool and keep, you know, um, uh, tramping the, the, with their hoof, hoover. So that's why uh, the wool felt over time. So this was uh, one story, but um, there are a lot of um, literature also uh, record the uh, discovery of um, the earliest uh, felt. Of course, we don't know if this is the earliest, but uh, so far uh, we know is uh, the discovery was in um, uh, Central Asia, in uh, Serbia. In Serbia, uh, we find a frozen uh, uh, burial uh, chamber in uh, outer highlands. Uh, it is a frozen area, and it finds some uh, kind of uh, fragment of felt, uh, which is um, which is uh, we can date back to the Bronze Age, very old. Um, so from those kind of dis discovery, we find um, some very interesting uh, felt product that are uh, used in that uh, period of time. Uh, for example, um, those um, Asian uh, nomad uh, trips, they use uh, felt to make tents or shelter, which is for their living. And also they, uh, make uh, boots or clothing or blanket with uh, wool felt because wool is a very um, good material. It can keep you warm, of course, and uh, also uh, it can be, um, it, it, you can use it for many different kinds of techniques. Uh, this is an example on your right-hand side, you can see this image. Um, this is an, uh, a piece of work from, um, uh, that period of time. And uh, you can see um, it's not only for functional purpose, it's more like a decorative uh, purpose uh, using a uh, different color of wool, uh, blending together and also kind of uh, mix and match together. Uh, you can see they are very clever. People uh, at that time, they are very clever. They use um, contrast color, you can see the red and green, um, really like eye-catching uh, colors. And uh, the motif that uh, you can see in this um, piece of work is very organic, but at the same time, you can also find some, uh, you know, dramatic shape around the, uh, the you know, on the edge of the, this kind of edge, edges. So I think um, they're very clever people and they um, have a very good sense on um, design and uh, with very uh, good uh, level of um, felting uh, uh, technique as well. So you can find some kind of um, sub very um, you know, abstract uh, motif look like animals in this work. And then later on, um, you know, uh, we find uh, felt in the West and uh, uh, for in the felt history, I think cap or hat is a very important part uh, because uh, in the West, especially uh, cap always uh, used as the symbol of freedom, which is a kind of cultural meaning for, for um for Western culture, uh, because at that time, like in the very old day, the slave, after they uh, have the freedom, they would wear, um, they would wear a, a cap to, to showing they're they free, they're not slave anymore. And also in the French Revolution, uh, you can find uh, there are a lot of people wearing hats. Uh, it's also another symbol of um, freedom. In this picture, this is the very, very famous painting, uh, Freedom of Leading the People. You can find um, the Jacobis uh, who play a very uh, important role in the French Revolution. They all wearing hats. So um, I think this is also another interesting story about um, fouting. Uh, so I'm going to talk about um, different felting technique. The first one is wet felting. Uh, for wet felting, we need wool fiber. Usually uh, the wool fiber we need uh, have to be clean and uh, combed. So with some kind of uh, pre um, preparation for, for, the, uh, for the felting. Uh, so in the picture, the top picture um, is uh, merino wool. Uh, the color is kind of light and cream, cream color. 
which can be dyed easily. So sometimes if we want to have a different color, we can dye it into different color. Uh, the bottom picture, you can see uh, there are some uh, uh, dyed uh, fi fiber, wool fiber, and on top, they, they are some um, uh, silk fiber because uh, for usually we use uh, we can blend different fiber with wool in in the felting process because um, uh, if the wool can felt easily then it can also um, stick with other materials other uh, fibers uh, and also if we add different kind of fiber we it can create more texture more interesting effect so I can I have seen some artists they add a uh, natural material or natural object like leaves or other um, material onto their work. So just quickly show you this video. I hope it will be very quickly. So I will um, maybe um, skip some step, but just to show you um, the process of wet felting. You can see uh, what we need is uh, wool fiber, of course. And uh, this artist using uh, alpaca uh, wool instead of the merino wool. So you can see the color is different, it's brown in color. And uh, she have um, decided the area she need to felt on this uh, rubber wrap. So the rubber wrap can help to provide more, um, more flexion for the felting so it can help the uh, felting happen. So she arranged the, the felt, uh, the, the wool fiber layer by layer overlapping each other. And then um, just to show you a bit quicker, and the next step she need to do another layer which is in another direction because um, if we want to make our fabric stronger then we should uh, give more layering when we, um, we put the fiber, um, I mean, we lay the fiber onto the surface, we need to do more layering, more overlapping. And in different direction, it's just like uh, weaving, like weaving in different directions. So it can help the um, finished fabric um, stronger. And then she um, also tried to, uh, uh, to add uh, water, hot water, so after finish um, laying different um, fibers on top, she um, sprayed the water, okay, hot water. I, I think apart from water, usually we mix uh, with uh, soap, okay? So soap water can help um, the felting happen. Okay, so just make sure um, the fiber, uh, absorb the water evenly. So she, she also add the soap on top. And then wrap the, use the bubble wrap to kind of patting, let the fiber absorb the, the solution. And then she put some decorative element so um, if you want to add some element, make sure that uh, they, uh, they, 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 they doesn't have to be in wool, but uh, make sure the, some, some wool should be uh, like kind of in between because it can help to uh, stick the material or uh, element uh, with the wool better. So she keep putting, um, other colors of um, wool fiber on top. And then again, spraying the water. And add more fiber. So now after the fiber absorb the solution, she is going to uh, wrap the the fiber and then uh, roll, roll the um, fiber. So rolling can help to give the 
energy, the flexion to, to the fiber and um, make felting easier, easily to form. So the, she will show a piece of finished fabric, which was uh, made by wet felting. So this one, she add some fabric on um, in between. So this is the wet felting technique. And, and then I also want to share with you, this is uh, my uh, another work, um, which made by uh, wet felting. So this was my uh, MA collection, a piece of uh, a piece from my MA collection. And this um, piece was um, quite difficult to make actually a lot of challenges because uh, as you can see, it take ages to felt a small piece of uh, fabric. So uh, this one, uh, although it's not like a whole piece of garment felted together because uh, you can find some seamless uh, uh, felt garment pieces, but this one is not. It was a uh, kind of tailor, tailor uh, coat that make from uh, felt fabric. So I, I have some seam, um, uh, different panel. I create different panels and then sew them together. However, still took a lot of time to make it. And this one, I use a merino wool. So all merino wool. And I try to make some contrast of the uh, texture with different materials. So I put a uh, ceramics, I insert a piece of ceramic uh, into the collar. So this is um, actually uh, quite difficult because um, uh, the ceramic uh, is actually quite heavy, but the wool is quite light. So it makes the collar quite heavy. I have to um, do a lot of experiment and uh, make sure the, the wall of the uh, ceramic object is kind of thin, it's not very heavy. And then uh, I really want to show the sharp edge of the, you know, a hard material uh, ceramics and uh, with the big contrast with uh, wool felt. I think it's a very interesting uh, effect. Then uh, needle felting. Needle felting is another technique uh, that you guys may be more familiar with because uh, as usually you can find this, um, this uh, we can find some kind of uh, kit uh, from, from uh, some kind of art and craft suppliers. You can buy uh, a package with wool and needle and uh, some kind of instruction, teach you how to felt uh, a door or a character. So um, this is a fun, uh, a very fun hobby, I think. Uh, so, um, for needle felting, we can make three-dimensional work. So some of the artists, they want to use uh, needle felting as the media uh, to make some sculpture. Uh, this artist is uh, an, a Chinese needle felting artist, is a very upcoming uh, uh, artist, um, Yin Yu. She um, used uh, needle felting to create different characters. Uh, they are actually quite big. And of course, she spent a lot of time onto it. And uh, the uh, main feature of her work is uh, she always uh, make mushroom, a mushroom character you can see at the middle of the uh, slide. Um, so I think using felting, wool felt to create a mushroom is look really well, very realistic because um, the texture and you know the color shade, um, it, it make it very um, interesting. Um, then the next one is, uh, is Nuno Fouting. So quickly um, just uh, simply show you this is a technique uh, quite new, um, not, not very new, but um, you know, developed in the early 90s. And Nuno Fouting uh, is a Japanese work of cloth. So uh, for this Fouting, we need cloth as the base and then we add some uh, wool fiber on top. So um, because the wool can, uh, can shrink after felting, so it creates a lot of um, texture on the fabric. Uh, for Nuno felting, you need fabric uh, with open structure because we need to let the wool fiber get in and felt with the fabric. So 
want to show you this one is another piece uh, of my work, uh, which showcase in this exhibition. Um, this is Nuno felting. I use uh, merino wool and silk on uh, felting on um, silk two. Silk two is a very uh, lightweight fabric, and it's just like net. So um, I deliberately uh, left some space without felting because I want to show the body texture, like the body skin color. And uh, with this method, actually, we can create very lightweight and very drapey uh, fabric because uh, when you look at the other, uh, maybe um, the uh, wet felting, the wool that uh, can create is quite heavy, but uh, Nuno felting can give you a new um, texture and new, um, you know, hand feel. So I have talked about quite a lot of uh, techniques and also the history of uh, felting. Um, here are some of the challenges I find for this handcraft. I think for felting, um, although we love it, but it's really um, uh, need a lot of time for making it. And uh, if we want to make it like become a fashion product that uh, we need a lot of voucher, we need a lot of uh, experience uh, and skillful um, labor. So we need to train them. And because um, felting always uh, produce one of a kind work, so it's hard to make, I mean, hard to uh, standardize the product. So um, this is also another challenge. And for most of the traditional uh, handcraft uh, that need to be uh, transmit uh, technique to the next generation, we find it's quite difficult because a lot of uh, Asian technique without any uh, documentation. So um, it's hard to, you know, uh, it's just only like from word of mouth from the master to uh, their uh, uh, student or their, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the worker. So it's, it's difficult. And also, I think it's important if we want to develop a technique or, ex, uh, ex, uh, you know, to, to, to transmit the technique or to preserve a technique, uh, we need to find market because if we make product without anyone to sell, the, the, the handcraft cannot survive, cannot sustain. So I think we need to explore new markets. So that's why talking about contemporary faulting uh, in the 21st century, um, a lot of fashion designer would love to use uh, faulting into their uh, work, um, especially for couture houses, because they want to create something like uh, one of a kind, very unique uh, work. Um, and later on, I will also talk about the new application of faulting technology. So, um, this is uh, an example from uh, 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 an artist and uh, contemporary textile artist called Liz Clay. She make a lot of commission work for um, different uh, brands, different high-end brands. Uh, this is uh, uh, three pieces from Stella McCauley Winter Collection in 2008. And you can see this is a very um, traditional way to make the fabric with um, wet felting. But um, because of the silhouette and si uh, styling, uh, the cutting, it looked very uh, young and sexy and fashionable. So it's not like as our uh, impression belting is old and dated. And uh, another designer, Christopher Kane, in his uh, Autumn Winter 2016 collection, using lace with um, you know, felt with uh, uh, wool fiber. So you can see from a distance, it looked like a painting. And uh, usually we think lace is sexy, is feminine, but with uh, wool felt on top is another kind of um, uh, feeling, right? So uh, I think this is also give us a very elegant look. Another designer, Victor and Wolf, in his uh, in their uh, couture collection, Autumn Winter 2019, you can see they use uh, felt uh, to create a really like big painting. In this um, 
outfit, you can see the, the moon was felted with, uh, you know, a contrast color, uh, wool felt. And then for the bottom is uh, using a different color of wool to create the, to imitate the, the sea. So I think it's very abstract, but very, um, you know, uh, uh, look very interesting. And because uh, wet felting can create heavy fabric, so you can create like a sculpture-like um, uh, uh, ruffle on, on the shoulder. And this one also um, should be used a lot of time and energy because you can see this wet uh, felting piece is uh, really big. So um, also use the contrast color to hide like the gradation of the colors. So apart from exploring um, different market or use uh, felting in a couture market, I think uh, we can also um, optimize the um, production process of felting. Like we can incorporate with uh, other technology. Uh, digital felt, uh, digital printing. I think a lot of people are familiar with this uh, technology because it's it's not that new now. It's, it's quite common, and I think using um, uh, digital printing can uh, be like a printing uh, product uh, uh, fabric easily with very accurate um, design. Uh, so you can standardize, kind of standardize the product. But then after you. Uh, print onto the fabric, you can uh, also apply felting, maybe uh, Nuno felting uh, to make the uh, fabric more unique. So just quickly show you, this is uh, a piece of work um, which is uh, in progress, um, work in progress. So I uh, put uh, merino wool on top. I just simply pull the fiber and arrange it and then um, and then use this tool. This is a needle uh, felting tool with more than one needle, so you can felt uh, quicker. Simply, I punching uh, the fiber with the fabric together. Yeah. So this is the process. Just I I want to show you, and. Uh, and then just to share another uh, technology, which is um, 3D printing. But I'm not going too deep to talk about 3D printing because I'm not an expert of 3D printing. Uh, Dr. Sun uh, um, Serena, she will have another webinar about 3D printing, I think. So um, simply we talk about 3D printing is uh, to uh, print the 3D design directly, uh, become a product. Okay, so with the 3D printer, uh, so inspired from this kind of concept, um, there was a research uh, um, develop a felting printer to print um, three dimensional uh, felting product. So uh, because usually we make, um, if we use a 3D printer, usually the material use is uh, kind of uh, hard and cold because they are plastic or in uh, metal. Uh, but if we want to make something like soft and more human-like, we can say, uh, we can use uh, this felting machine uh, with the Wu Yang. So I'm going to show you very quickly that uh, the, the process or concept of this um, technology. So it was a Disney research. So um, it could be a, a technology for the future Disney character. Um, so we create a, the, the three-dimensional design uh, from the 3D software. And then usually printing with 3D printer, the product is um, kind of hard and cold, but um, with this uh, felting machine, with this felting printer, it can be soft product with the cozy wood, woolen texture. So the process is um, not that difficult because um, it's just like you uh, thread the woolen uh, thread to the machine 
and then the machine can um, can kind of um, eject the the fret and then uh, needle punch the fret layer by layer. So it just build different layer to create the three dimensional um, object. So just like a sewing machine. So simply build the- um, Jackie, um, yes. to, uh, have to, we have limited time. Yeah, for yeah, yeah. Our it's... speaker. <laughs> yes. So we're gonna go ahead and leave some of the interesting stuff to share, continue in the panel discussion. Mm, yes, so, yes, sure. Uh, We'll go ahead and move on to our next speaker. Thank you yeah. so much, uh, Ms. Jackie. Uh, <laughs> to Dr. Juan, so we'll have uh, TC Juan to uh, talk about some of his work and just insights about the technique of um, pleading. And um, so please also continue leave your comments and uh, questions in the chat box. And we'll uh, talk about that after um, uh, Dr. Juan is uh, complete with his part and moving into the panel discussion. Okay, uh, all yours, Dr. Juan. I should, oh, hello, I should unmute myself first. Uh, we have a very strict uh, facilitator, so I will just pump into my <laughs> point because we're running out of time. So, um, hello everyone, this is Dr. Juan, and this is my, I'm the second speaker, and today, uh, this, uh, process is pretty simple. I will simply introduce the technology in pleating in my own categories. So you will never see these category elsewhere. Then I will I will introduce how I have respond, uh, reflect on the technology before I start to use digital fabrication to produce a pretty like work. Then I will introduce briefly of, of my uh, research project with my uh, co collaborator, Dr. Min, uh, Min Jin Lin. Then I will have another reflection after I have this collaboration with her. Then I will gonna show you, I'll tell you what is that pleating can do in the future with the ref, with influence from the technology nowadays. So my background is mainly from theater and drama. So my work is really building to body conscious and how performance, or what I would say is more extreme body human human body posture to create different type of garments. And ple pleating is my medium. So today uh, I would like to tell you about uh, how pleating in different category. In 1999, this text, uh, textile exhibition in MoMA, the, uh, the curator Matilda McKee, she kind of categorized pleating into three types, which was manual processing, continuous machine methods, and the hand pleating methods. And in 2015, um, Andrew Bolton curated an um, uh, exhibition in MET called Menace Cross Machina. And he specifically using this um, uh, encyclopedia as a, as a guideline to introduce different techniques in fashion and te textile technology. So I visit these, uh, his uh, route and which trace back to 17th, 18th century. So I visit these uh, fan shops in Paris and they use this traditional way to pleat a pleat fan. However, no matter is Andrew Bolton's methods or Matilda McKee's methods, they are both based on thermal pleating, which is pleated down by heat or steam. However, through the technology in, uh, in evolution, I would like to categorize pleating into four types. One is stitch pleats, and the second type is thermal pleating, and the third one is structural pleats, and the last one is digital pleats. The first one would be stitch pleats and it can be dated back to 17th century or even before. So people just simply using thread and needle to create pleats and stitch them together. So they are more like a, a dead pleats because they are not flexible. A very well-known designer called Madame Claire, I visit her work in, um, in FIT Museum in New York. And you can see that from the backside of her garments, these pleats, all menu, um, all hand process and done by stitch one by one. So they are, they are fixed, they are not flexible. This can be reflected into a 
very similar te te technique called uh, smoking. And on your right hand side, this machine is a pleater or smoking machine. Uh, in the UK, we have a manufacturer called Pr uh, Princess. And this is the one you see that on the screen. And the reed, which one, I, which is the one I use these days, is, is manufactured in South Africa. And Amanda Jen and Sally Stanley. And they have different rows, like 16, 24, and 32. So the wider rows can produce the wider smoking work. This is a stitch pleats, this uh, categorized one. And the second one is what I categorize is thermal pleats, which is, I would say 90, 98 or even higher percentage of the pleats on the market you see. So the pleated skirt you bought, even from Issei Miyake, they are all thermal pleats. Uh, it, it has a long history. You can trace back to 300 BC back in China. And this is silk skirt. And also we cast our eye to Egypt and they have this loin clothes the material is linen, and they are also done by the heat. In the place in the uh, late Victorian age, they have these flare skirts in the bustle style, and they, uh, the woman back in that time, using this type of pleating, um, uh, splitting and machine, I would say it's more like iron, but it's not a flat iron, it's this curved iron. And from this book, Mothers and Daughters of Invention, you can see that how Alton Stanley introduced the machine back in the 19th century. This machine have the limitation of this width of nearly just 20 centimeters long. So later they invented, uh, this is how I demonstrate the machine in a small workshop. We heat up the plate and the iron first. Well, in the modern times, I just use oven, but in the old times, people use coal to heat it up. So we're gonna stitch it back to the flare of the skirt. Uh, so you can see the plate is pretty small. So later on, they create these roller style. So they can create unlimited length of these pleated skirts. And for this type, I would like to introduce a very well-known designer called Mariano Fortuny. He's not just a fashion designer, he's more like a well, a well complete artist. He do fashion, he do textile, he, do, uh, he does um, theater design, lighting design, furniture design. The most well-known his work is this Delfo dress, which is a silk one. And he, he leave these uh, sketch when he applied for patent. And people think that might be the machine that he could create these uh, beautiful fortuny pleats. However, these textile, these um, were scholar, Kathleen Kearney thinking that might not be the way because it's the, the machine have these blue, uh, white hollow ceramic tubes, which is um, hollow and full, full of uh, hot steam. And he, she examined that with these tiny points touching the, touching the fabric, you can't really stabilize pleats in, 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 a longer, in the longer run. So she examined the, the history and back in the early 20th century, around 1910, she found out that uh, Fortuny is really uh, fascinating uh, with uh, enthusiastic about Japanese culture. And, luck, and, and at the same time, as in 1900, the World Expo is held in Paris, even though Fortuny most, most of the time rest, um, resigned in Milan, but she, he traveled to Paris quite a lot of time. And this specific technique from Japan called Aramatsu Shibori won the bronze prize of the technique. So Kathleen Kearney thinking maybe Fortuny get inspired by this technology and he know this shibori technique to create these fortuny pleats. So I experiment with my um, participants in my workshop and we create these shibori technique to create these fortuny like pleats. So you can see that on the far he right hand side, this is a pleat done by this shibori technique. And the left hand side is the original fortuny garment, Delfo from the FIT museum. And the right from second from the right is done by this couple or which Matilda McKee uh, categorized is um, 
hem process, hem pleating process, which uh, cement pleating Joe has done a lot in the studio, and she will introduce that method later. So I will say maybe Fortuny use uh, achieve these Fortuny pleats through Shibori rather than just using that machine. And also Isai Miyake, which is the design giant, uh, his, his design, is his pleats pleats is also done by heat set. So bear in mind, all his garments are polyester. So which basically is plastic. Before we get into the third category, I will have to introduce the 2.5 category, which is more like structural and thermal. Pleats. You can see that design, design team. Thermal uh, stretch yarn. So when they touch the skin, it will stretch. So it was flat at the beginning, but once they touch the skin or heat, it just contracts automatically into the structure that embedded into the fabric to create these garments through these woven structure. So a double layer woven textile after steamy or touching the heat, it becomes a, a dress and it can be put on, um, on models and to demonstrate the garments on the capital. And in, this is 2012, and in 2015, he, their design team created an even more complicated pattern, which is a very, uh, it's, I, I will call it is a water bomb uh, origami pattern and transfer from Japanese uh, origami history, um, tradition and onto the fabric. Actually, not just uh, Isen Miyake team has done this, uh, and Richard also introduced these woven textile that shape themselves she also introduced how you interweave these thermal yarns into the fabric and use steam to create an automatic contract into a pleated fabric. The third category, what I will say is structural pleats. And on the left hand side, you can see this is the by, it's done by Drew McVitt and the right hand side is done by me. I just simply use 100% wool and just use the structural of the knitted textile to embed it the folding structure. So this is not affected by heat or not heat, uh, affected by um, humidity. So the original idea is to create a permanent pleat, permanent pleats, not just through th thermal, but also natural fiber. And this uh, designer called Jacqueline Laffer, she in the other, on the other side using these um, woven structure to embed the pleated structure into her garment. She doesn't use um, thermal pleating. He just simply use elastic yarns to create these um, elastic garments to create this pleated style. The fourth category, I would say digital pleats. After 2000 or millennium, when the digital uh, fabrication become popular, designers and scholars using different methods to create pleats in different ways. So Dr. Tina De Rosa, she's also from Royal Cut for Art and she created these metal pleats using Kate, um, auto Kate to create this, um, to, to build up or embed a bronze metal onto a pleated structure. And Professor to Tomohiro Tachi, he in the end studied a lot of structure and create this software to create PT structures virtually on the screen. Also, uh, Danish a designer, and also she collaborated with this Icelander designer to create these wooden textile. She she uh, she named it. She used Kate and laser cutter to create different type of uh, palette and 
put it onto a, wood, a very thin layer of the substrate of textile and to create this wooden pleated textile. And also in nowadays, we can use Cloth 3D to easily create these sort of virtual pleated structure in the, on the screen and to see the effects on the human body even without producing it physically. Not just creating this pretty skirt, very simple structure, we can also create this very uh, complicated water bomb structure for sleeve. So before I start to use this digital fabrication for pleating, I will say technology somehow in a very craft-based person, it is the almighty God. It's like I, we're thinking technology can do everything without any human touch. So when I see uh, Iris von Herpen's work from late 2000, uh, yeah, first decade of 2000, I was just overwhelmed by this modern technology. So I decided to experiment with uh, technology with my uh, collaborator, Dr. Min Jin Lin, and she's uh, focusing more on 3D printing and also uh, or, or 3D structure. So we kind of taking this idea of using Farewell My Concubine, the most well-known uh, Beijing opera piece to redesign a costume. And we decided to apply this pretty structure. Well, after that, I wouldn't say it's a pretty structure onto a specific, especially arms or other area that create most movement when they perform. So it's very interesting Like I thought as a, as a 3D printing technology, we just use computer and use 3D printer to print out what we need. But actually we really need a craftsman knowledge to start from folding paper and translate the folding structure onto the screen. So this is our like kind of the steel shot, and we have these performance in Silk Museum in Hangzhou. So you can see that on the screen, they are the 3D printing part. This SLS printer, so it's a powder-based printing, very soft. And we've done several like uh, post performance survey with performers and also the audience. And we, we receive very positive response how these chrome colors costume compared to traditional one deliver even more sorrow, compassion and feeling to the audience. So when I received the printing uh, outcome from the sponsor, Sintere from Finland, we actually quite surprised because due to the um, machine limitation, each print part is just, just as big as 15 centimeters by 15 centimeters by 20. So it's pretty, it's pretty small. And to be honest, I need to make it as like a, like a puzzle and to join them together and by hand stitch each part as a whole piece. So I realized actually, even though we're using modern technology, hand stitch or human touch is necessary. To be honest, I was a bit frustrated by this because I thought 3D printer, 3D printer should just print out the whole sleeve in one go by one click. But actually in the end, I spent lots of time hand stitch each part all together. So after this research project, I realized it's not just that easy with a techno a modern technology. And you can see that from uh, these um, uh, Nano Ravi from 2014, he, her Prekabote work. We can see this hand stitch of this 3D printing part onto a substrate. And also from these uh, Iris von Herpen's work together with Mike Hoppepel, for this New York City ballet, you can see that they still using um, laser, laser cutter to cut each PVC pieces and then 
hand stitch each piece onto a mesh substrate. So I realized human touch is still essential even nowadays for, for fashion and textile garment making. And also with, through 3D printing um, work, I realized it's just it not printing, a 3D printing, not just bringing a new form. It also helped me to interrogate what is the definition of these pleats. We create this sort of pleated like form, but would you call it a pleat through the help with the modern technology? It kind of question the essential quality of what a pleat is. If it's just a shell or it's a form of a pleat, it doesn't shuttle between two D flat surface to three dimensional structure. Can you call it a pleat? Then what is essentially a pleat is? And in further, if a pleat can in the future work automatically on its own, like autonomous pleats, it got its own life. Will, will that create another uh, level of the uh, new type of pleats? So from Deleuze, he says that we only have to consider the manner by which the elements are now going to mediate, distend it, and broaden the relation of clothing to the body. In every instance, folds of clothing acquire an autonomy and a fullness that are not simply decorated effect. So will the future please become movable on its own, become autonomous? Or can we create another type of police, which is a virtual police, when the digital world is embedded with all the digital uh, static uh, information? Can police exist in another form without any physical existence and it be stored into a digital form and with this zero one digital number? So can that be another type of police in the future? Okay, so this is my presentation today, and I would like to hear more from you guys and also from our panelists. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Juan. That was uh, very interesting. And um, I will go ahead without further ado, I will go ahead and move into our panel discussion and uh, share some uh, uh, question during your presentation so far. So let me uh, give a little bit more info to our uh, industry panelists. Uh, uh, from uh, this is a uh, man from um, Thailand, Mancraft, and also we have uh, Joe from uh, Semen Pleading, which I will uh, share more in just a second. So, a little bit more on a uh, man from Thailand. He, I mentioned before, he does uh, wearable art uh, using um, natural dye locally sourced and uh, uh, labor also locally sourced in his hometown, uh, Sei Kung. Uh, Correct me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, Nak Hong uh, in Thailand. Uh, so he worked with uh, different uh, plant dye uh, source, dye stuff. And uh, this is uh, the area he has been passionate about for a while and producing different kind of uh, simple basic wearable and scarves. And um, so I just a little bit of info on his background. Uh, he uh, had his uh, fine art, uh, master of fine art degree in design, uh, but he actually previous, I would say, I don't know if I'm correct, like previous past life <laughs> is in law. So he actually had very uh, uh, contrasting uh, experience in his um, academic training. Uh, mm -hmm. So now he's moved into, you know, working with the design and um, dyeing processes for his uh, Minecraft products. Um, and of course his studio and also he works with weavers locally in his hometown. Uh, so one of his uh, uh, recent projects is Man Garden to uh, develop a creative craft center um, to support local uh, uh, economy as well and you know support the local craftsmen um, and artisans. 
um, for the sort of social sustainability. I would say, man, like your area of work is kind of slow fashion, as we commonly know. Um, and just, uh, you know, if you guys are interested, those of you in audience interested in man's work, follow him on Instagram, man.craft or Facebook, mancraft shop. Um, and also he's, uh, some of his work, as you saw earlier today, uh, with natural dye. Um, uh, whether it's bamboo or uh, flower dye, or whether it's from leaf uh, or root uh, of different plants, okay? Um, these are some just captures from his Instagram. And then also our uh, semen pleating uh, rep. And so this is a uh, Matt winner uh, in the picture on the top left. That's uh, he, this uh, generation, third generation of semen pleating actually. Uh, he's currently uh, serving as a CEO for the company. So this is a company that custom does custom um, pleating for different uh, uh, commission uh, based work for different specialty clientele that includes our lovely Lady Gaga, Kelly Minogue, and also uh, Queen uh, of England. <laughs> and of, of course, you saw um, uh, here uh, different brands that they uh, worked with, and also feel free to follow them uh, just uh, over at Instagram via pleat or the semenpleating.com. Now I want to, uh, you know, introduce uh, Joe Duncan. Miss Joe is from uh, Semen Plating working as a production manager. So who, who's joining us today and representing Semen Plating. So her background is actually uh, um, actually working with Intimate where uh, her, her Bachelor of Art degree was in contour fashion. Uh, and she has also had uh, experience background in swimwear development. And she's been doubling uh, most of her, you know, professional career, I would say, in pleading now. Um, so some of these captures are also from pleading, uh, semen pleading's Instagram. So definitely look them up and follow on Instagram if you can, because they really have a lot of inspirational imageries and it's a fascinating how they come to um, create these images or these textures for different whether it's I mentioned earlier in the chat for both aesthetic and functional uh, kind of features. Now uh, I want to just give us uh, you know quick capture of some of the imageries from semen pleading which I may come back to if um, you know some of your question pertains to you know the pleading um, Kind of process or techniques of uh, um, for semen pleating um, or traditional uh, pleating techniques. Now, in this panel discussion, we're going to go ahead and uh, look at a set of key questions um, for these uh, uh, our panel uh, guests and also our speakers. Um, and I will also put in my two cents as as. Uh, we have time if possible. Um, and then if uh, those of you who had some uh, questions, I will try to bring them into our conversation as we answer questions as well, okay? So this is uh, the first set of questions for our um, uh, folks here. Um, so some of the things that we want to know more is for mainly um, for Joe and Ben is how would you describe the handmade production process of your products and compare it to commercial production? What are some of the its highlights like in the technique and your final product? Um, what, what are some of the trends you see in your particular uh, area of technique? So feel free to take a, uh, a dip, uh, no particular order there. <laughs> Who wants to talk first? <laughs> Don't want to talk over someone. Okay, so um, a, well, Joe, you can go ahead and take a first step. <laughs> uh, so we, for most of our clients that we use are in the fashion industry and uh, we also do a lot of work for the theatres, uh, movies. We have quite a lot of movie productions that use, our, uh, that use us and uh, also uh, interiors, not just fashion. We also do quite a lot of interiors for pillows and wall panels and things like that. Um, uh, we have machines here. We do machine pleating and, and quite a lot of it is hand pleating, which we use these cardboard molds, which I'm sure you've seen the pictures. 
This is just a flat chevron pleat. And um, uh, this is these sort of things are to translate this into fast fashion. Uh, it, it's a process that's like well, like you said that takes a long time. Uh, and the, some of the, the panels are only quite small, so you can't mass produce this uh, in, a, in a large scale. So a lot of these, or, or a lot of our customers are couture fashion. That's the, you know small one-off pieces or a made, a made to met, uh, re, you know make one made, made to wear garment that will just be worn once or be a decorative art piece. Um, and then more of our machine pleating, something like this would be used on a bulk scale. In terms of a fashion trend, this was quite popular in 2019, 2016. We completed a lot of this style, the uh, crystal pleat in, in tulle. You imagine uh, uh, Victor and Rolf, they've done quite a lot of this with the layers of tulle on top of each other and created these structural garments. Uh, and then that then started off a trend of uh, pleated chill all our customers from then on carried on do, you know doing chill wedding dresses and, and things like that uh, I, I would say for for us the machine pleating is probably the most popular because uh, you can do meters and meters of it all in one go but the the thing that is most eye-catching is that the hand molds create these sort of structures which can be can be used you know, quite versatile in you know like a shoulder piece or you know in a small scale but it's practicality might be quite limited and on, on how you can use this on a daily on a daily garment <laughs> but yeah we've mentioned about things being very time consuming that that is, you know, things do take a long time, but for us, yeah, you see in these images, um, the we can do it quite quickly. A lot of those hand patterns, it might take us about 15 minutes to actually pleat it because we've been doing this for quite a long time. And the steaming process, that's how we set all our garments or all the fabric, takes about half an hour and then it will then go out our steam box and cool down for half an hour. Uh, and then once that's ready, we can then take the fabric out of the cardboard molds and do it again if, if we need to keep doing it again and again. Depending on the cloth, we might be able to get more than one layer of cloth that will reduce time for us and we can get it up, done a lot quicker. But um, yeah, every, every, everyone in the industry wants stuff done the same day or as quick as possible. As you can imagine, fashion, they're always behind and quite late. Uh, and that's that's the our, our unique point is that we can get it done quite quickly because the majority of our orders are small you know like I said it's couture fashion we may just do you know a week's worth of pleating for one catwalk and then they will then go on and make uh, these beautiful garments and then next week we'll be working on a completely different project we'll be doing something completely different we've just recently finished doing uh 700 accordion pleated uh just up and down very simple accordion pleating for a train refurbishment and that we've done that in a month and then after that they've gone and uh, added this into just the curtains for a train very simple thing but they wanted to use us because we were based in the UK and we can get it done quickly for them mm -hmm. thank you Joe and then um, let me bring back uh, the questions for men so men tell us a little bit more about your um, man craft work Uh, firstly, I would like to introduce my uh, brand called Mancraft. Uh, um, founded on in 2010 uh, in Sapunakot. Sapunakot is in the northeast of Thailand, so it's quite near Laos, near Laos of the country. In Sapunakot, we have the local people, like we have local wisdom of the natural indigo dye, and also the and spinning cotton and uh, silk. And also, um, as, as Serena mentioned, my education background in um, Bachelor of Law. Um, in, um, my family uh, think, thought that um, the, the law is the foundation of the, like the, the, the basic 
size is then we have like five people nowadays. So I quite feel confident with the, to do like what uh, contracts or uh, to like intellectual property in, uh, in my work. And also it's I, I think in in the in the art and craft world and also the the work from the local people we have to consider about the intellectual property and also the, uh, which is easy to, to, to lose and also to have some money, to, uh, which is unfair. And also, um, let, let me show you some of my work. Um, I'm working with uh, mainly natural, natural dyes. And I um, set the base um, to to provide uh, my to provide a natural dye plant such as indigo and also cotton, uh, marigold flowers, cosmos, and also some of the um, um, plants that I I I like. I want to experiment in the future, and. This is my, this is some of the work. And this is like, um, mainly I do scarf, like wearable art scarf. And this is one of the, um, my very first collection. This is the, mainly I work with the cellulose fiber or um, rayon viscose. And this is a manufactured cotton and with natural dye, natural indigo dye. It's about 19 shades of indigo. You can see the gradation mm. and, and the weaving take the um, like, like, um, and also, man, can you hear me? I, I, I like the, um, the gradation of them. And also the to feel yes yeah, yes I, I can hear we, you. We lost I, your can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? I think we lost your connection okay. for a bit. For a few, uh, oh. maybe like five seconds. Okay. Sorry. Okay. And, and uh, this is my very first collection called uh, Indigo Spectrum. It's from from a uh, natural indigo dye. Uh, I like to play with the um, the shade of. Um, dye colors, and also this is the one of the example of the brown, brown shade, and this is uh, the example of the from black. Black is the small insect, and this is the multicolor shawl with a natural dye. And Very cool. Yes, and this is the um, naturally white cotton, and this is the brown cotton. The is naturally. Um, Five brown fiber, and this is the manufactured cotton, and this is some of the um, dyed cotton from from lac. This is the mud mud dye, and this is the um, myrobalan leaves with indigo, so it gives green, and this is the cosmos flower dyes, and uh, I I like to play with the color like multicolor. And also the because my um, because I work with the weaver, but sometimes I want to express my myself. So I I I like to play with the techniques like the hand stamping, um, tie dye, yeah. and all, like the modern dye, mm -hmm. and the painting. And this is some of the traditional technique, the supplementary weft. I'm sorry, uh, this is the supplementary weft with the natural dye. But uh, May uh, I some ask a follow up quick question? Man, yep. um, what's your like a main uh, client, like a customer, uh, target customer that you're selling these uh, products to? Uh, my, my target customer is quite very, uh, someone who appreciate in, um, in art and craft and natural dye 
So is that uh, mainly in Thailand or do you export as well? Um, mainly in Thailand, 95%, but I, I, I do export some of um, the um, international mm -hmm. country, yeah. I see. And to follow up, uh, I guess like this kind of easily segue into our next questions for the two of you. So what are the biggest challenges that you may face today running a business on the traditional uh, techniques and, or just being part of uh, this traditional technique business um, for, you know, uh, natural dye, shibori, uh, you know, even a natural dye print and as well as pleating. And then what do you like? What are some you know design project you particularly find it challenging, if there's any? For us, uh, I think the hardest thing would be uh, managing some of our customers' expectations, and and you know there's always new fabrics that are coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, things that we always have to adapt to and we ourselves aren't always sure if something new may pleat very well uh we have a, a few years ago ended up trying to pleat this sort of um uh like metal brett based brass cloth and it was only limited to certain pleats something that was a lot bigger we, we could try and get it in and we didn't actually need to steam this it was just put it in the pattern in, in between our two cardboard molds and and squash it together and it just naturally held the the pleat afterwards there was no uh process to steam it after you know it, it just it just that's how the the product came out mm -hmm. we've also uh recently had to create some uh large wall panels for uh i think it was for a nightclub in london uh, and what the customer wanted was uh, a very large finish size because obviously pleating does reduce down I'm so sorry, the phone lines are, are, are ringing. You have to. Good for um, business. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and, um, and yeah, the, the customer wanted these uh, wall panels that had a very large finish size. They also wanted uh, to pleat a really thick linen. Uh, and they wanted it as a box pleat. When, when we're having a box pleat, it, it becomes quite tricky to pleat you know, two layers of, uh, and, and, and fold it into the right position. So we had to work with the fabric and work with our customer. We ended up changing the pleat to be just a simple knife pleat, a flat pleat. And because uh, they wanted it to finish quite large, we then um, uh, made the, the, the under pleat quite small, which then made the, the, the panel size quite big. But we were restricted to the size of the cardboard because he wanted like a three meter piece by two meters wide and the card we could only source at the time was i think uh one meter 60 by by the, the width of our tape you know we, we had to limit uh, our sizes so then we you know talk about doing two panels and then they're hiding their seams underneath an underplate uh but eventually all our customers are quite forgiving and they understand there's only so there's so many limits that we can do and, and, and it may be the case that we just change the size of the pleat to work with the fabric or maybe change the pleat entirely but eventually people can adapt their designs to work with what we have in the factory we have a long a massive archive and you know, i'm sure you've seen the pictures of yeah. hundreds of different patterns and they're all very similar just a variation of a different size or or maybe a, a smaller width pattern but uh, but we can also make custom patterns for customers and uh, it depends on how much money they want to spend with us because uh, it takes us time to make new patterns and that's how we, we charge our customers how long it takes us to create a, a new mold like this, for instance, it can be done in just, I don't know, half an hour, mm -hmm. you just have to spend the time to make it. Uh, traditionally, uh, when, when this company first started in 1925, you would have had uh, 30 employees at the moment we only have four uh, and there would be one or two employees where their job would be solely just to create these cardboard molds and that's what they would spend their day just creating these molds and you need the perfect pressure point in your uh, when you're when you're using a score or a scriber you would need the you know how to, how to work it and as these these people would do it all day they could you know look at a design and make it instantly where we're always uh drifting between different pleats and doing different projects 
it may take us a while to figure out how um, to, to go back to, to the drawing board, as you say, and, and start to make this again from scratch. But eventually we'll get there and, and then um, we'll figure it out. Uh, we've got, you know, a massive archive of, of all the different moulds and how to start making them again from scratch. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. And what about you, man? What challenges uh, that you face in, in your area of work? And especially traditional surface design. And this is quite even different because you're looking at, like uh, the semen plating is looking at special clientele for custom work. And you're working with, you know, also locally sourced artisans and, you know, material, natural dye. These are not exactly, there's a lot of uncontrollable elements, right? Um, the, the biggest challenge, I think, to work with the people and the season, because in in um, in Thailand, um, my my river, the river that they, they have like the, the their main job is to a farmer, a farmer like in this season, the rainy season, they go to farm, they don't live anymore. So if if I first time like in my very first time in two thousand and ten when I start to work in the traditional uh, living field and I have to understand their lifestyle first and also to, 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 set, to set a new schedule of working because the, um, the first time I want, I want to export art and um, to Obasi, but but when, when I got the order from customer, like, like um, very small quantity, like 100 pieces in, in rainy season, in the rice farming season. So I, it's very difficult to, to send to, I, I mean, to, to finish the, the order. So then I look, I, I, then I, I concentrate and I think I have to change my new, um, my new strategy and uh, about the 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 project. Yep. Yes. I just want to ask you a question after you finish. So I just mm -hmm. raised my hands. Do <laughs> yeah, you want to go ahead and ask the question? Oh, because I I, I can somehow understand like both cement peeling and man. You guys work really heavily with manual labor. Mm -hmm. Do you find modern technology can have some interferes? like you know to either boost up the the production or do you find the modern technology or digital technology can help in any way for me i think um because uh, the low low tech low tech low technology and also low slow process is like the our um, our value mm. yeah, of, of production so mm. I, I i think the um, new technology or high technology can can help about um, the quality of of the product like the finished product mm. like the colorful or some of the um, how to say the uv protection mm. or anti is for the, um, the the textile like like nowadays the code is is everywhere so mm -hmm. if if we can do technology or some of the the, the research to to apply to our uh, production would, would be great yeah. yeah yeah and we actually uh this is a great insight actually but you know we actually just have a minute left in our uh webinar today and i wanted to go ahead and ask like what you guys think in your work so far like um some of the advice that you can give to young aspiring designer or just young people in general who are interested in arts and crafts and traditional surface design, you know, medias? Uh, I think uh, the best advice is to experiment and explore different mediums. Uh, it, with pleating, it is absolutely endless what you can do with it. You can uh, take one pleat and then put it for a different machine and keep developing it uh, to make something completely unique and new. Um, as opposed to what we normally do is quite uh, simple and, and, and tr traditional, if, if you would say, but, but you can keep developing the same thing over and over again and uh, it, it can look quite modern and new. And 
uh, yeah, completely different. Yeah. And what about you, man? What do you think? I, I, I think um, sustainability is yeah. the, um, the, for the future. Mm -hmm. And, and for, for, for everyone, like the new generation, if, if, if you are in the, like the local, local area, like, like outside the big city, I, 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 I want you to, to find the, um, the materials or the, lose the connection mm -hmm. from, from the place, the, the place and environment around you and, mm. and, you, and you can decide what you want. I'm sorry. Yes. Generation like young people. Hi, uh, you you live in the um, the countryside, mm -hmm. and and you know local wisdom or know how of mm -hmm. the weaving or or basketry, right? And you can apply, and you have to find the um, the the material or the new technique, which is quite um easy uh, now because you you have like the you can you can uh, use the online class like mm -hmm. like me I. Oh, I like yeah. class, yes, and and also the research, like the some of the research article, yeah. and it's good for you to uh, the product and or or to have inspiration from from this. Yeah, yeah. be be resourceful yeah. and open minded to learning new things, basically. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, guys, so much for your answers and. Thank you for so much for the participants today. Um, and then I want to just give uh, a quick, uh, you know, update. We will be promoting more webinars throughout the summer. So if you're interested in some of the digital tools, as Dr. Juan and Jackie mentioned today, um, I will be talking about more in August in the digital tools. Uh, so keep uh, stay tuned and follow up with us. Okay, thank you so much for participating today. And um, yes, have a good evening and great. Uh, have a great rest of the week wherever you are coming from. Mm. Thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.